Um, thank you so much, uh, Dottie, for, for organizing all this. Thank you, Sheila Mitchell, for, for being a good friend and, and making it happen for me. I just, I'm really appreciative. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's amazing what we can do with modern technology, that we don't have to travel great distances uh, to do these things. I was, I was recently on, uh, on a program with the former president of, of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, who has his own program out of Belgium. He lives in Belgium now. And, and, and people in Argentina we had like there were eight, like eight hundred thousand people actually ended up getting that video and, 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 and being on it live. So it's just amazing what this technology does. But I really, really appreciate um, having having been was part of this group. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to just pay a little tribute to the founder of Ions, uh, Edgar Mitchell, who was a, a very good friend of mine, very dear friend, and and. Uh, a man who went through some very interesting experience in life and some very tough ones too. Um, so thank you, Edgar, for making all this happen. So getting down to um, the topic at hand tonight, I, I think you know it, it's touching the jaguar is a great theme and and a, and a good topic for this because the reason I wrote this book is because I'd written five books, as you mentioned, Dottie, on, on indigenous people and shamans, the world is as you dream it, psychonavigation, shape-shifting. And before I wrote Confessions of an Economic Hitman, there were those five books. And then there was Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which took everything way to the top. It sold over, it's sold now well over two million copies. So it's, it's been out there. And since then, three other books on global economics and intrigue. And it's been interesting because <laughs> when I speak to groups, um, what we might call kind of new age, ions type of groups, people who are really interested in shamanism and those types of things, I've often been asked, well, you can't be the same guy that wrote those economic books. Can you, you didn't write confession? That must be a different John Perkins, right? And when I speak at, at international economic forums or at corporations, which I, which I do a lot of these days and do a lot of it virtually, they say, well, you're not the same guy who wrote those shaman books, are you? And in, But for me, there's always been a very strong connection between these two genres that seem at opposite ends of the spectrum to a lot of people. But to me, they're, it's shamanism is the way to change the economy, to change corporations. And, and we're going to get into that touching the Jaguar. So although I'd written these two genres, I never explicitly brought them together. I didn't talk about shamanism in the corporate books. I didn't talk much about the economy in, in the, in the uh, shaman books or the indigenous books. So this book I wrote particularly to, to bring the two together, these two genres, and to really talk about how we change a failing economic system that we, we know we have today on our planet. And it's not just economic, it's, it's, it's governmental, social, economic system that that's, uh, many economists are referring to as a death economy. And we'll get into that more in a minute. Um, and so in Touching the Jaguar, and I actually, I wanna read to you where, the, 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 so the name for the book comes from this shaman in, in Ecuador back in 1969 who saved my life. And I, I wrote it down at the time and it's been a guiding principle in my life ever since. So, and it's at the, it's at the beginning of the book. Touching the Jaguar means that you can identify your fears and barriers, confront them, alter your perceptions about them, accept their energy, and take actions to change yourself and the world. And that's it's kind of like one of the opening sentences in, this, in the book. Isn't that Jaguar great? I mean, this one's really great too. I love this one. You know, it's wild. He's got an anaconda hovering behind him or her. Um, and so, um, I think the key to what I just read is how perceptions alter reality. And I'm going to get into that. So I think I'll start with a story because my books are storytelling books for the most part, because I think people get a lot from stories. Stories we know are more influential than facts alone. Uh, and so th these are true stories. This story goes back to 1969. So in 1968, late 1968, I was a Peace Corps volunteer sent deep into the Amazon rainforest uh, to live with in the in Shwa territory with Shwa people who were this who are this indigenous culture of hunters and gatherers. They were leading very uh, 
very, their lives were very, very close to nature when I went in there in 68. It wasn't, I wasn't there too long, 69. I got very sick. I was dying. I couldn't keep any food down. Uh, I, could, I couldn't stand up without help. And to leave this place and get to a medical facility, I would have to walk for a day through very dense jungle and then get to a dirt old dirt road that wound from about a thousand feet above sea level in the jungle to up to 15,000 feet in the high Andes and then back down into a valley. Two days in a rickety old bus, if I could find one, to get to the nearest medical facility. There was just no way I could possibly do that. So I was resigned to dying. And late one afternoon, uh, I was, the, the, the school teacher, who, who was one, about the only person I could really communicate with, my Spanish wasn't very good at the time. He spoke Spanish, most everybody else spoke schwa. Uh, <laughs> one of my first lessons uh, with US government work was they'd sent me to a school for eight weeks to learn Spanish and then sent me to a place where nobody speaks Spanish. <laughs> US government work. And then they taught me to be to form credit and savings co-ops because I, I just graduated from business school. And when I get to this place where I'm supposed to spend the next two years as a Peace Corps volunteer, I tell them, I'm here to help you form your credit and savings co-ops. And they, the, the, the school teacher, the one guy communicating through, looks around like, are you crazy? Like credit and savings? We don't, we don't have any money here. <laughs> Everything's barter, you know? You're bananas for my papayas. So second lesson, US government work, they, they, they give you an assignment to do and send you to a place where you can't possibly do it. Anyway, another story. So here I am dying and late in the afternoon, the school teacher brings this little tiny schwa man, very old, tiny guy up to me. And he says, this guy's the shaman. 1969, I graduated from business school. I, I, I'd never heard of a shaman. I, I don't think many people in the United States, have, we'd heard of witch doctors, but shamans? So, but the idea that he could heal me that night uh, got to me. So I figured <laughs> I got nothing to lose. And that night he did. He took me on this shamanic journey. <clears throat> we'll do one in a little bit ourselves. But this was an all-night one. We won't go quite that long. Uh, and on that journey, I, at one point, I, I this vision quest, shamanic journey, I'm, I'm, I'm visioning things, and I see this amorphous mass in front of me, moving around. And the shaman, through the translator, says, touch the jaguar. And I look all around like, Jaguar? And we're in the jungle, like, oh my God, where's the jaguar? And, the, and, the, and I get the message, no, 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 the jaguar in your vision, don't touch the jaguar. And this amorphous shape just shape shifts into a jaguar, very much like, like this one. Again, I'd like to show this lady. Um, he says, touch the jaguar, touch it, touch it. So in my vision, I go out and I touch the jaguar. And as I do so, I hear this voice saying, son, it'll kill you. And I realized that here I am, I grew up from about 300 years of Yankee Calvinists in New Hampshire. I grew up in New Hampshire. I came from Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut. We were very hygienic, washed our hands a lot. We ate very bland, mild foods. And now suddenly I'm in a place where nobody's ever seen a bar of soap. And the schwa were eating foods that seemed very, very strange to me. Uh, for one thing, they don't drink water. They, they know that the rivers are filled with organic matter. Uh, you can't drink the river water because it's got a lot of organic matter. They know this from experience. And so they make a kind, the women make a kind of a beer. It's called chicha. And it's made by the women chewing manioc root and spitting it. That sets up a fermentation process and, uh, and then you can add water uh, to this alcohol that's been produced and you can drink it. So I'm drinking a lot of spit beer and eating a lot of strange foods. Like one of their great delicacies is you go to a rotting log and pull out a handful of squirming white grubs and down the hatch. <laughs> but there weren't any cliff bars. There wasn't any um, Perrier. 
So I'm drinking a lot of spit beer. You got to rehydrate a lot in the jungle and eating a lot of strange foods. And I realized on this vision quest that every time I ate these foods or drank this chicha, I heard a voice saying, son, it'll kill you. At the same time, I saw how incredibly robust and vital and healthy the schwa are. You know, the men are hunters and they carry, they kill wild boars and they carry them for miles out of the forest on their shoulders. And, and people live to be very, very old uh, if they don't die from snake bite or some sort of a hunting accident or something like that. And the women, um, well, I was in my early 20s, the women were looking good. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so on that vision quest, I, I get it. Like, it's not the, the food and drink that's killing me because it's making them healthy and strong and vital and robust. It's my mindset. It's my perception. The next morning, I woke up and, and uh, I was feeling great. A few days later, the shaman came back to me again with, with the translator, the guy who could speak Spanish, and his payment demanded that I be his apprentice. Now again, 1969, business school graduate. I had no interest in being a shaman's apprentice. There was no future in shamanism. There is now, <laughs> there wasn't then. But the guy saved my life. So um, what could I do but agree? And I went through about a year of training with him. Uh, and later, I went up to the Andes for another year in the Peace Corps with the Quechua people, trained with a shaman up there. And, and, and after that, when I was an economist, an economic hitman, I, I, I took time whenever I could to train, to get to know and to study with. Sometimes training may be too... Uh, maybe too overblown for some of those, those experiences that were much shorter, but to go and be with the shamans in places like Indonesia and Egypt and <clears throat> Iran and all over Latin America and, and in North America to some degree. And what I discovered was exactly what this shaman in the Amazon had first told me. And that was that our perceptions mold our reality. It's the basis for all shamanism. Uh, when you come right down to it, that you know, the fact of the matter is, we know that there's no United States, uh, there's no Ecuador, there's no Canada, there's no culture, there's no religion, there's no uh, corporations, there's no economy except as we perceive it. And when enough people accept a perception or codify it into law, it has a huge impact on reality. It determines human reality in almost all levels, and that's that's the basis of shamanism. But it's also the basis of psychotherapy and quantum physics, advertising, marketing. It's, it's, it's the basis of our lives, that our lives are controlled by perception, how we perceive things. And so, you know, I, I learned, you know, to kind of look at this as, as, as you've got a reality here. And let's say in my case, this is this reality that's spit beer and squirming white grubs. If I have a bridge that takes me to the next reality, that the bridge that to crosses, it'll kill you. That takes me to a reality where I'm getting very sick. If I change that perception, I start with the same reality. I'm still drinking spit beer and eating squirming white grubs, but I change that to, it makes them, these, these people healthy, it must do the same for me. And in, in contemporary terms, we would say that that food was organic and local, incredible. I mean, highly nutritious, amazing, wonderful food from a nutritional standpoint. Uh, so once I change that perception, it takes me to health. And what the, the Schwa would explain, or what many indigenous people that I've worked with, many Amazonian people talk about this idea of touching the jaguar. So they'd say that you've got to cross this perception bridge. And on this bridge, stands a jaguar and the jaguar is telling you you got to stay with your old belief system basically so you got to stay with that belief system that this food and drink is killing you as long as you don't touch the jaguar as long as you don't face it confront it understand it and if you run from it it'll just chase you but if you go out and touch it as i did that night the jaguar then gives you the the power 
the wisdom, the courage, the energy <laughs> to change your perception. And as you change your perception, you change your reality. And I, I came over the years to realize that that's true of, of, of so much in our lives. When I was an economic hitman, I, I have to say that, you know, after I got out of the Peace Corps, I, I became an, I, I did what I've been trained to do in business school. I became an economist for a major consulting firm, and I very quickly rose to chief economist. And, uh, but my real job was what we call that of an economic hitman. My job was to convince, well, at first I had a, I had a large staff of, of anywhere from 30 to 50 people at different times. My, my job was to have them produce reports and econometric models and studies and, and uh, uh, such things. And first of all, identify countries that had resources our corporations want, like oil. And then get the, convince the leaders of that country to accept a huge loan from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. And the way that we convinced them to do that was to show that, well, if you accept this loan and you hire our companies, you got to hire our companies to, cre to create new infrastructure, to build big electric power systems or highway systems or port systems or industrial parks. If you do that, your economy will grow. And so my job really was to create a perception amongst these leaders that, that that's what they needed to do. And in the process, of course, our corporations made huge profits off of this. And the leaders could go out and, and convince their, their people to uh, accept these loans that put a huge financial burden on these countries. And for many years, I thought I was doing the right thing because in fact, if you, if you look at the statistics, you see that when you do invest these large amounts of money in these infrastructure projects, the GDP, the economy grows statistically. But perhaps because I'd been in the Peace Corps, perhaps because I'd been on the downside of hydroelectric dams and many other things, after a while I began to see that those statistics are really a lie, that they're totally skewed in favor of the rich. So what was happening was a few rich families were making a lot of money off these projects. The ones that own the industries, that own the banks, that own the commercial establishments, that own the, the shopping malls, that, that used a lot of electricity, used the highways, used the ports, and so forth. And the majority of the people were suffering because money was being diverted from healthcare and uh, uh, education and other social services to pay off the interest on the loan. In the end, the loan, the principal couldn't be repaid. And so I'd go back, or we, usually under the guise of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and, and tell the country, look, we can help you restructure your loan so it'll make it easier to pay. But in order to do that, you're going to have to agree to certain conditionalities, such as sell your oil, whatever the resource is, real cheap to our corporations without environmental or social regulations, or uh, privatize all your public sector businesses, uh, your schools, your, 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 your utilities, your water and sewage systems, your schools, maybe your, your jails, whatever, and sell them real cheap to our investors. Uh, let us build a military base on your soil. Uh, vote with us on the next United Nations vote against Cuba or whatever. There's, all, there's different conditionalities. And so what I began to realize is how unfair the system was. And let me give you an example. In the United States, we know now that there's three individuals who have as much wealth as the bottom half of the economic strata in our country, the, bo the bottom half of our population, the bottom half, speaking, economically speaking, bottom half. Three people have as much wealth as half of our population. In the world, we know it's about 25 people have about as much wealth as, as roughly 70% of the world's population. So if in the United States, those three individuals last year make 10% return on their assets. And the majority of the people lost 3%. Uh, you'd still see a growth in GDP of something around four and a half or so percent. And most people don't realize that. And I didn't realize that. And it's certainly not taught in business school. And it's certainly not something that I think even most business professors even think about very much. It's just accepted. 
the perception is GDP growth is good for everyone, but it's not true. And again, it's based on this perception that we sell out there that, that is there to help the very wealthy and to help big corporations, global corporations. And really when you come right down to it, this model has produced this death economy. It's produced a failed global economic system or failing one. And a death economy is an economy that, that is based on one goal. And again, this is a perception, but it's the stated goal of businesses to maximize short-term profits for a few, cons for a few stockholders, essentially, uh, regardless of the social and environmental costs. Now, that's not a perception that I was taught when I was in business school pre-1976. I was taught that a good CEO makes a decent rate of return for investors and takes good care of his employees, gives them health insurance and pension funds, takes good care of his customers and his suppliers, and takes good care of the communities where his corporation works, you know, pays taxes. <laughs> Imagine that. And also um, may invest some money in the education system or recreational facilities, doing good things for the community. That all changed in 1976. Uh, Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize of Economics in 1976. And, and Friedman said many things, and some of them were good. But one of the most important and evil things that he said was that the only responsibility of business is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. It had been an idea that had been growing. Von Hayek won the Nobel, won the Nobel Prize in, in economics a few years before Friedman, and he said something similar. It had been growing, but Friedman with Friedman it really took off because he was very influential. He became an advisor to Reagan and Thatcher and many other people uh, and uh, all over the world. And so this concept became the accepted premise, but it's the goal of business is to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. In fact, he said, if, if you maximize short-term profits, the, the environmental and the social problems will take care of themselves. It's total BS. We know that now, and we know that it's created an insane system, a system that's failing us. It's consuming itself into extinction. It, in the short term, it consumes the resources that it needs for the long term. And it's also based to a large degree on, on militarization in many countries like the United States, where so much of our uh, economy is driven by the, the, our mili uh, the militarization. Um, but I think it's really, really important to understand that it's all just a perception that perception has had a huge impact on reality. And I should go back and say one other thing about the economic hitman business was not only did these presidents or ministers of finance or whoever that I was dealing with accept these loans because it would make them and their cronies, their families wealthier because they owned the, the industries. There was also this other aspect, which was people we called jackals. And they were looking in the background and these presidents knew that if they didn't accept my deal, the jackals would come in and either formulate coups and overthrow them or maybe assassinate them. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a long history of that. I mean, in the United States, we've admitted to having a very deep involvement. The CIA had a big involvement in the overthrow of Salvador Allende of Chile and most of the deck of Iran and Lumumba of the Congo and Ziem of Vietnam and most recently, Zelaya of Honduras in 2009. Long history of that. So a president, it, it, it's, it, you know, I had an easy job in a way of saying, hey, I can help make you really rich if you buy this deal. And then if you don't, somebody's going to come forward. I don't, I don't do that kind of stuff. But there's somebody looking in the background that will. And in fact, I had two, two clients that democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and the head of state of Panama, Omar Torrijos, who, who did not play the game. They had a tremendous integrity, and they both died in, in very suspicious uh, private airplane crashes at, at three months apart from each other, less than three months apart from each other. So it's a very insidious game. It's not a game, it's, it's so serious, but it's called the game as old as empire. 
uh, and uh, but it's all based on this perception. And so I've realized um, as I, I, I stayed in that job for 10 years. And during the first five, I was absolutely convinced that I was doing the right thing because that's what the models say. That's what I've been learned in, in the economics. And I was working for the World Bank. I mean, they were, they were, they were paying a lot of my company's bills and they were promoting us. And so were so many other institutions and still do, in fact. But as time went on, I began to see that what we were really doing was creating a new form of colonialism, a new type of empire that was based less on militarization. The militarization is always there as a threat, but it was really based on debt, debt, enslaving people in debt. And, but once I understood this, I gotta tell you, I didn't want to understand it. And I think this is important because I think an awful lot of people are in this kind of position. Um, I'd grown up the son of a teacher in a boys boarding school in New Hampshire. My dad didn't make any money basically. That we had a house given to us on, on campus by the school, a small one, and we had, I ate in a school dining room from the time I was four years old. We, we weren't wanting for anything essential, but we didn't have much cash ever. And yet I was surrounded by very, very wealthy boys all my life who came from wealthy families all over the world. And then I went to that school for four years as, during high school. And, you know, I developed this desire to have what these wealthy boys had. And now as a chief economist, I've got a huge expense account, like traveling around the world, flying first class, staying in the finest hotels, eating in the best restaurants, whining and dining with, with presidents and making a good salary. Um, so I, I didn't want to believe what my heart really knew was happening. Uh, so I, I hung in there for a while and I had a, my conscience was getting worse and worse. And at some point, I began to see that what I thought was the American dream, I was living the American dream, I thought, but I was really unhappy. And I was living on Valium and alcohol to a large degree. I was flying through time zones all the time. I was flying off to Indonesia from Boston and, and, and getting there in three or four days, that's all, and having to negotiate multi, what would today be multi-billion dollar deals. And so I would land in Hong Kong or Jakarta, Indonesia and at night and, and, and take Valium and go down to the bar and drink a lot and then get up in the morning and load myself with coffee. Uh, and at some point I began to realize I'm not, I, I don't enjoy this. But still, how could I give that up? It was the American dream and everybody was telling me, you know, I'd, when I talked to people, guys who worked for me or women who worked for me or other people, they'd say, well, you got it, you know, you're living the American dream. There was a perception. This was the American dream as a perception. But in my heart, I knew it wasn't. And then I had this amazing, enlightening experience. Uh, you know, after being in there for 10 years, I, I took a vacation uh, and I rented a small sailboat in the Caribbean. I loved to sail. And I sailed to St. John Island and the, and the Virgin Islands. And uh, late one afternoon, I, I, I rode the dinghy ashore and I, I climbed up this hill to an old sugar plantation. And it was idyllic, it was so beautiful. This old plantation was in ruins, but it was, I was surrounded by bougainvillea. I was looking out at the sun setting over the Caribbean. It was, it was gorgeous. And I thought, wow, this is so idyllic. And then it occurred to me that this plantation had been built on the bones of thousands of slaves. And then I suddenly I had to think, well, the whole hemisphere is built on the bones of millions of slaves Afri from Africa and from all over the, the, the New World, from all over the Americas. We have so slaves, so many slaves. And then I had to admit that I too was a slaver. Different, of course, I wasn't putting everything in chains physically, but I was enslaving people in countries 
through debt and creating this, this empire, colonialism. And at that moment, sitting there in those ruins, looking at the Caribbean, <laughs> I made a vow that I would never do it anymore. And I went back to Boston where my headquarters were and went to the president of the company the first day I was back and quit. It wasn't easy. It took, took a while to actually, to actually quit. A lot of forces tried to convince me not to. But, and then I decided eventually to, um, to devote the rest of my life to using what I had learned in this process to turn things around, to transform this death economy into a life economy. And the subtitle for this, this book, maybe you can see it here, the subtitle is, um, I think you can see it, Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life and the World. Touching the Jaguar, Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life and the World. I think we all have some fear, um, and a lot of it's around change. And right now with this coronavirus, I'm sure a lot of you are going through some some difficult experiences. Uh, I think most everybody is. Um, but it's actually creating an amazing opportunity for us to realize that the system we've created is dysfunctional. This death economy is dysfunctional. It's, it, is the, it is the creator of all the crises that we're facing today, whether it's global climate change or or income inequality, or species extinction, or um, what it, what, whatever the problems are that are out there, the coronavirus, those are just, that they're problems, but they're, that they're also symptoms. And they're symptoms of the greater problem, which is this economic situation that's consuming itself into extinction. It's based on maximizing short-term profits for businesses and for individuals. It's basically, it, it, it teaches us the perception is you need to maximize short-term um, consumer materialism. That's kind of the message that's sent out across the world. And people, even really poor people in, in Africa and in Latin America, developing countries, they'll see movies or they'll see pictures of the United States, it's incredible consumerism. They want to be here. They want to experience that. They want to get into that. So, it's, but it's all this perception, and to, to to cross this bridge. So, let's say the world has a lot of natural and human resources. The perception is these must be used to maximize short-term gain, short-term profits, and that takes us to a death economy, a system. It's not just an economic system; it's a governmental, social, economic system that is destroying itself consuming itself into extinction, failing us. If we take that same first reality of the world is filled with human and natural resources and we change the perception to the goal is to maximize long-term benefits for people and nature, we move to a new reality, which is the life economy. And a life economy is an economic system that, that pays people to clean up pollution, to regenerate destroyed environments, to recycle, to come up with new technologies that don't destroy the earth, that, that are renewable, regenerative, that use the wind and, and, so, and, the, and the sun even much more effectively than we're doing today. I mean, we've, got, we've made huge progress in solar and, and wind, but I, I, hopefully 10 years from now, we'll look back and say, my God, that was primitive stuff back then. <laughs> um, maybe that uses the air to create energy. The kind of stuff that the founder of IONS uh, envisioned many times and talked about, uh, Edgar Mitchell, uh, and uh, so the life economy pays people to do this. So imagine, you know, like about $52 of every $100 you pay in taxes, if you happen to be an American citizen or American taxpayer, uh, 52, 54, that, in that range out of $100 goes to the military establishment in the discretionary budget that we have. Imagine if that money or half of it went to pay those same companies, in addition to new entrepreneurs, but also paid Raytheon or General Dynamics to instead of um, hiring people to make missiles, they hired people to come up with new technologies and processes for mining all the plastic in the oceans 
and in the rivers of, of Asia and so forth and, and recycling it. And that, actually that's happening. Um, and imagine if companies were to pay people to really clean up all the terrible pollution around the Amazon or oil has been leaked so badly in places like Ecuador, so many, all over the world, oil leaks everywhere. I mean, there's a huge economy out there waiting to happen that's a renewable, regenerative economy, a sustainable economy. Uh, so when, you know, people often say, well, we've got to, I don't want to go back and live in a cave. We're not talking about that. We are talking about some lifestyle changes. But I think this is an amazing time to look at how we can really move forward into a system that's much better than the one we have and much more satisfying. And uh, so if we take the, so I, I, another little story here. <laughs> Um, a number of years ago, you know, I, I take people on groups and I'd love to have some of you come. And I think probably the next one will be in January to the Mayan people of Guatemala. But I've, for, the, for many years, taken people to, to the Kogi of Colombia in December and the Maya of, of uh, Guatemala in January and into the Amazon and in August or in, at other times. Um, and a few years ago, during in one of these groups to Ecuador, we were in the high Andes with the Quechua people. People speak Quechua, there's over 100 million people in Bolivia, Peru and Ecuador that are Quechua. This marvelous shaman woman in the high Andes who has the great name of Maria Juana, <laughs> Maria Juana Yambarela. And one of the people in that group, and I was translating, so I was involved in this conversation all along. And so, Maria Juana, how do we save the earth? And she, Maria Juana, laughs. And she says, well, the earth's not in danger. But we are. And so are a bunch of other species. Life as we know it's in danger, but the earth's not in danger. You know, she said, we're just like so many fleas. And if we get to be too much of a nuisance, Pachamama, Mother Earth will just shake us all off. And then Maria Juana points up at Imbabura, this sacred volcano that hovers over her home. And she said, a few years ago, that volcano was covered with a massive ice cap. It isn't anymore. Pachamama is twitching. She hasn't shaken us off yet, but she's letting us know we better change. And then Maria Juana looked around at each person in the room and said, you know, you and, and I, we are so lucky to be born at this time because we're able to listen to Pachamama. We can listen to Mother Earth. We can change things. We can turn things around and we better do it because she's twitching. She's letting us know. And after that, um, every time I heard of, experienced a major hurricane or heard about a big earthquake or fires in California or Australia or tsunamis, all of these once in 100 year events that happened every year or so now. Every time one of those happened, I remembered Maria Juana. And I thought, well, the, yeah, the earth is sending this message. The problem was people weren't getting it on that level. Uh, it was all seen as local. And so if you happen to be experience one of these events, if you're in a hurricane, for example, you experience one of these events, live through it, you would expect the outside world would come to help you in a few days, or maybe a couple of weeks. Bottled water would arrive, food would arrive, and then some leader would come along and say, well, we're gonna rebuild, but we're gonna go back to normal, but we're gonna be even better than we were before. And so th there was these localized events. And so now we didn't listen, so now Pachamama kicks us in the butt with this coronavirus that impacts everybody on the planet. And, um, there is no outside world to come to our rescue. We've got to do it. And, you know, I'm even be, before this virus hit, I was in a, I felt blessed that I was in a position to travel around the world. I spend, I, you know, give talks in China and Russia and all over Europe, all over the world, in many places. And everywhere I go for the last 10 or 15 years, and it's been growing, I've seen this consciousness rising. We're, we're in a consciousness revolution it's been prophesied so eagle and condo prophecy the Quechua people 
the Mayan prophecy of 2012, all these prophecies have been telling us, and there's the prophecy, the Jewish prophecy, <laughs> the Christian prophecy, all of these prophecies have been telling us that we're entering a very, very important portal for the possibility for change, new consciousness. And people around the world have been waking up to this for some time, a lot of people, but it hasn't been enough to really cause change, or maybe because we've, we're afraid of that change. We're, we're afraid to touch that jaguar. Uh, and now I think people are really getting it. And I've been on a lot of programs recently. I was on two today, before this one, uh, webinars or, or podcasts or, or whatever. And uh, most of them are shorter than this, and they really want me to co focus on the, on the coronavirus and what people can do to touch that jaguar. And I, I like to tell people, you know, if you're, if you're sitting at home and you're, you're like freaking out because <laughs> I, don't, I can't take another week of the self-isolation, much less a month or two months, or is it going to be a year? I don't know. I'm, I'm just totally freaking out because I just, I just can't handle that. That's a damn big jaguar. But if you go out and you touch that jaguar, the jaguar may tell you something like, hmm, haven't you always wanted to learn to play the flute? You got a flute, and there's the internet. You can learn how to play the flute. You have time to learn to play the flute now. Haven't you always wanted to read more books? Didn't you always want to read War and Peace? <laughs> you figured it was too damn long, you know? Now you can read War and Peace. You can watch more movies. You can write a book. You can learn to sculpture, to sculpt. You can learn to paint. You can, you can, whatever it is, you can get better at it. Uh, or maybe you just, you want more, you've always complained that you don't have enough time to talk to your family that's overseas. But whatever it is, you touch that jaguar and it tells you, look, there's a great gift here. You know, and I recently, I, on one of these discussions, a, a woman came in on the chat group and said, I'm a waitress. I, I, I've been laid off. Uh, and I, I, I love waitressing. And I, I love food. And I know that this is somebody in Seattle and where the mayor of Seattle has just said they're probably going to lose half the restaurants in Seattle as a result of this. And this woman was saying, I don't think I'll be able, I don't know that I'll have a job again. Well, what do I do? How do I touch that jaguar? And, and my response was, well, you know, you love food, you love doing this. Maybe you should really look at, at uh, opening your own restaurant or opening, you know, using your own home as a kitchen and you can deliver food to people who can't, even after the virus is over, there'll still be a lot of people that won't dare go to restaurants or aren't able to because they've got some sort of a disease. There's some reason why they can't. And so that's, a, that's been a growing trend. So, I mean, I think we can all look at how do we, how do we touch the Jaguar that's the coronavirus at this point? And I'm, I'm going to bring this to a close now so we can go to some questions and maybe some answers. But I just want to leave with, with, with one final thing here. And that is that in the book, Touching the Jaguar, I offer a, um, this daily practice. And there's a workbook you can get if you pre-order the book at John Perkins on order or anywhere at this point. And you can buy it at your local bookstore. That's fine too. It's all on johnperkins.org. But um, this practice is, I, I think it's a, it's a very powerful one, but it's also quite simple and it can, you can do it in less than 10 minutes a day or every two days or once a week or whatever. The essence of it is to answer five questions. And so I'm not going to go into the whole process, but we may go into these five questions deeper during the shamanic journey. But the five questions go like this, and I'm going to use my own example as to really give a little more detail about these questions. The first question is, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? What is my heart's desire? What is my bliss? What is my higher purpose? Why am I here? Or you might say, when I'm on that proverbial deathbed and I'm looking back, what will I be most grateful that I did finally do? Or what will I most regret that I didn't do? To realize now is the time to do it. What do I most want to do for the rest of my life, regardless of how old I am and what shape I'm in? Two, how does that tie in with making a better world for somebody else? So I think to get real satisfaction in life, it can't be just about us. We have to be helping others. And that, the other could be one other person. It could be your family. It could be your city. It could be your country. It could be the whole world. But how do I, 
how do I use my passion, my bliss, to also tie that in? So if I take the first question, what do I most want to do for the rest of my life? I, I love to write. I, I love to write. So I want to keep writing. Two, how do I tie that in with something bigger? Well, in my case, I write stories that I hope will inspire people to transform the death economy into a life economy. The third question is, what Jaguars do I have to touch? What's held me back? If I look at writing, I can look at things more recent, but there's always things that step up. But the biggest one was when I went to high school, I was considered a very good writer. I was editor of the newspaper. I won a short story prize. And then I went to college, majored in English, and my, I had an English professor who was a famous writer. I had, oh my God, you know, like he's God. Uh, <laughs> and he was extremely critical of my writing. I never got anything above a C. It was so discouraging to me. Writing meant so much to me that I dropped out of college. And I eventually went back and I didn't study English or writing. I went into business school. I studied economics and business. And then years later, uh, I, I, I wanted to, once I quit being an economic hippie, I wanted to write about it. And I, I'm still scared because of this one experience I had. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, this guy's just a human being. And then it occurred to me that same English teacher had highly criticized Bob Dylan's writing. Huh. Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize in literature. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, wait a minute, this guy, he doesn't necessarily know what he's talking about. So I touched that Jaguar. Perception changed from, well, this guy's God and he's criticized my writing, so I must not be a good writer to, well, this guy's just a dumb English teacher. <laughs> he's just one voice. And that touching that Jaguar was extremely important. And then um, the, uh, so the, it's, so the next, question, uh, what, what uh, perceptions do I have to change? So I've already answered that. What perceptions do I have to change after I touch the Jaguar? And that is my perception of you know, my abilities to write. And the fifth question is, what actions do I take? And for a writer, it's you, you gotta write every day or nearly every day, even if you're not publishing every time, you, you gotta write just like a, a pianist. If you wanna be a professional pianist, pianist you better play the piano a lot, not just when you're on the concert stage. If you want to be a professional tennis player, you play, spend a lot of hours practicing. Writers have to do that too. So those five questions, uh, what do I most want for the rest of my life? How does that tie in with the bigger issue? Uh, helping other people, what's standing in my way of doing that? What are the barriers? Uh, and then how do I touch the Jaguar? What do I get when I touch that Jaguar? How do I change the perception that's created those barriers? And lastly, the fifth one, uh, what actions do I take? And we can go through a whole daily practice. And I think on the, on the journey, each of you can, can get into that a, a little bit more. But I think what's the most important here is to recognize that we're, we are all in this amazing space right now. You were, you were born at this incredible time in human history that so many cultures have prophesied as being a time when a portal opens for the eagle and the condor to come together, for the, the mind and the heart to come together, the male and the female to come together, the, the, the indigenous and the scientific to come together to create a new consciousness. And we know that we're, we're living on a fragile space station, the earth, and we're the pilots. We have so much control. We've been piling it toward disaster and now it's time to reboot the navigation system to turn things around. And I think, Dottie, I'll, I'll stop there and Maybe let you feel some questions, see if people have any questions. That, that okay. Thank you, John. Now we have time for a few questions, so why don't you just raise your hand and I'll see if I can see you. You're actually on two pages, so I might have to click back and forth. But if you have a question, just raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask the question. I'll call on you. Anybody? Does anybody ask questions in the chat? Or you can type it in the chat and I'll read it. Well, come on, noetics people, you're supposed to be very <laughs> That's what noetic science is all about, right? I mean, that was, that was Edgar's vision from the very beginning and Lewis Harmon and yeah, come on. I have a question. <laughs> right there at the top right. Where? Oh, Helen? Yes, I have a question. Thank you, John. That was amazing. 
to listen to. And I have, um, I, I am familiar with your books. Um, but I have a question. How come they let you talk about these things? In other words, how come you're still alive? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you are, but it's, it's curious to me. It's a great question. Yeah. It's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. And so when I first stopped being an economic hitman, I immediately started writing a book about it. And I decided I wanted to be an expose. I wanted to contact other economic hitmen and some of the jackals who I, who I, who I knew personally and get, get their stories. As soon as I started calling them, contacting them, I got threatening phone calls, anonymous voice, a strange voice, uh, threatening my life and my daughter's life. I had an infant daughter at the time. She's now 30. She has her birthday's tomorrow. She turns oh, 30 wow. tomorrow. <laughs> and fortunately, she only lives 10 minutes from me. Oh, um, and uh, so I took these calls very seriously. I'd seen what these people could do. At about the same time, the president of Stoner Webster Engineering Company, a big a competitor of the company I had just left, the consulting firm I had just re re resigned from, the president of this other company took me out to dinner. And he said, you know, you got a great resume. You were chief economist at our arrival and you did a great job. You brought in a lot of work. We would like to uh, use your resume in proposals that we send out to companies. You won't have to do any work for us. Just let us use your resume. Now, that was not a terribly uncommon thing. The companies do this. Um, and he said, you know, I'm prepared tomorrow to write you a check for half a million dollars. $500,000. This is in the 1980s. It, yeah. it was, it's, it's, half a million is nothing to laugh at today, but it was a lot more then. And then he turns to me and he says, just don't write that book. You can't write a book about our profession and continue to work in that. And so my life's being threatened and I'm being offered a bribe. In fact, what's happening to me is exactly what I had done to the presidents and, and ministers of finance and others in other countries, you know, offer them the carrot and the stick. And, you know, I got to say, you know, I, I ask, well, what would you do? You know, my, my daughter's life is being threatened. My life's being threatened by people I take very seriously or I'm being offered a bribe, essentially. It's a totally legal bribe. What he was offering was excessive, but legal. And so I took the money. But I have to say, I didn't build a, a big house or, or buy fancy cars. I put the money into going back to Ecuador, going back to the Amazon, going back to the Shua people, in the light of the Achua people, and to writing five books about that, about indigenous cultures. And incidentally, they all live a life economy. Indigenous people have the life economy, and we all come from that background. If you look historically for the 250,000 years or so that we've been humans or seen ourselves as humans, uh, we've almost all of those years we've had a life economy until fairly recent, a blink of the eye in terms of human history. And so I went back and I started working with them and I founded the nonprofit Dream Change and then Pachamama Alliance came out of that. And it, and then, and I wrote five books on indigenous people and shamanism. And that was fine with Stone and Webster that I wrote those books. And then on 9-11, I was in the Amazon. Uh, and I think shortly, not long before that, uh, some of you, Sheila had been on a trip with me and you know, we were, so, but on 9-11, I was, I was there with a group of people. Um, when I came home, I immediately flew to ground zero to New York. And as I stood there looking into that pit, um, I uh, knew I had to write the book. But I decided this time I wouldn't tell anybody I was writing it. I wouldn't write an expose. I wouldn't contact anyone else. I would write a confession purely personal book, nobody else's story, it's just mine, basically. And I wouldn't tell anybody I was writing it until I had it all finished and in the hands of a very good New York agent. I figured that once it was in his hands, it was my best insurance policy. Because at that point, you know, anybody that would think that, you know, if I'd threatened to write the book again, if I contacted people, they can stop you before it's written, but now it's written and it's out there, it's going out to publishers. So the last thing they want is for me to be a martyr. If they killed me, then the, you know, some, the, the publishers are gonna make a lot of money off me. So, uh, and, and it, it, it worked pretty well that way. I will say that a year later, uh, after the book, less than a year, actually about four, five months after the book came out, I was supposed to speak in an event in the United Nations in New York. Flew to New York, 
And the night before I was supposed to speak to the United Nations, I was poisoned. And I spent uh, the next two weeks in the New York hospital, Lenox Hill, and they ended up removing uh, over 70% of my, of my colon, my large intestine. Uh, but I don't believe that was, and I've, I've talked to some of the my jackal connections, that that was, that I know who did it. I, I, we, we never been able to find him since. It was a guy who posed as a, as a journalist and took me out to lunch that day. I'm, I'm almost positive he disappeared after that completely. We, all we had on was an email address and it was, it was, it was gone. Um, and I think he wasn't CIA or NSA or anything like that because they're not that stupid. And if it had been one of them, I, I wouldn't be alive. Uh, so the best guess was that he was a fanatic who either hated uh, what I did as an economic hitman or hated the fact that I exposed it and then disappeared. And probably, you know, I, I, I talked to a couple of my jackal friends and I asked, I said, well, was he likely to reappear? And they said, no, not if, not if that's who he is because these guys tend to be pretty cowardly and he's done his thing and he doesn't want to get caught now and he figures he's, he's, made, his, he's made his point. Um, and I just add one other thing. <laughs> Thanks for asking because, and I'm sorry to go on so long, but no, it's fascinating. <laughs> but I had this amazing doctor, gastroenterologist, um, and after two weeks in New York, I'm ready to fly back to Florida where I lived at the time. And and in my last session with him in New York, he calls me in and he says, "What I should be telling you now is that you're a carnivore. Carnivores have small." colons. Uh, herbivores have large colons and omnivores have something in between. You, you, you were an omnivore, but now you're a carnivore. Uh, and I should be telling you, don't eat any more salads, don't, don't, eat, don't eat vegetables. You're basically, you're basically a carnivore. But he said, while you were in the hospital, I read your book, Shapeshifting. And I think you can change all this. And he said, you know, when you came to me, you had seven, about seven feet of colon and I took five. You had about 25 feet of small intestine, of which the last five don't really serve much of a function except to connect to the large intestine. I think if you do what you talk about in this book, which is basically a perception change, uh, you can shape shift that five feet of small intestine into large intestine. So I, whether it happens physically or not, I think it can happen energetically and you can live a normal life. And I gotta tell you, I'm a vegetarian now. I'm, the, I'm not a carnivore <laughs> at all. I'll eat meat once in a while if I'm in, uh, in Latin America or someplace where everybody's eating meat and I don't, I don't want to insult people. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not obsessive about it. I'm, and I don't, I don't have to be that I choose to be a vegetarian. Maybe for philosophical reasons and now because I like it much better. Uh, so, so I have no doubt that that's exactly what happened. That shapeshifting. That, so again, it's it's it's, it's a great shapeshifting story. I yeah, think. it is. It's, now I have to get two of your new book, two of your books. <laughs> um, no, they both sound fascinating. Thank you. That was that was amazing. You're welcome. Well, well we have a few <clears throat> a few questions, but we also want to leave time for the shamanic journey. So maybe we just have one more question. Um, let's see. Uh, there's four of them here. Let's see. Hmm? Oh, Oliver's raising his hand. Oh, and Oliver's raising his hand. Go ahead, Oliver. You have to unmute yourself. So, John, pray tell, what is the most challenging jaguar in front of you to touch at this time? A great question, Oliver. I, I think it's uh, at this point. To really help people to figure out how, as a writer and a speaker and people that does these sorts of things, I can most help most people realize that they need that they have a fear, probably change, and how to touch it. And you know what I find is that probably all of us on this program uh, lead pretty good lives. And they, they, that may be challenged right now by the, by the virus. But, and we probably, most of us have considered that the, the system isn't working. It needs to change, whether we've identified it as a death and life economy or whatever we know that it's got, but, but we're afraid. 
Like, oh, what does that mean for me personally? Does that mean I can't go back to Latin America anymore? If we, if we change, if we move into this life economy? And, and, you know, this virus has taught us that we can all get along without air, air travel, basically. We can do things like this virtually and many other things. Um, so we're afraid to change. And then half the world uh, can't even afford to think about change because all they can think about is putting food on the table for the next meal for their families. And then there's these people at the top of the pyramid, economic pyramid, who think that everything's perfect the way it is, that they get the power, they get the money, they don't want change. They're gonna do everything they can to hold us back. And it's easy for us to say we wanna be held back because that's kind of the easy thing. It's a little bit like me not wanting to recognize that what I was doing as an economic hitman was bad. I was too comfortable. And so, but we know in our hearts we must change. And so for me at this point, the challenge, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, and I, I hope it has a big impact this way, but is to really help people understand that when we talk about moving into a life economy, we're not talking about giving up uh, beautiful lives. We're talking about entering even more beautiful lives. Maybe being less materialistic, yes, but being more open to, to being more, more spiritual, to doing more meditation like Dottie led us through at the beginning or the Detroit journey we're just about to do, uh, to, to be more oriented toward music and poetry and, 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 and all these things that we all know that what we, re, what we really want to like, we don't need more, we, most of us don't need any more stuff at all. Uh, but how do we move into that? And that's the real challenge now. And, and, and right at this moment, the challenge too is this idea that we couldn't get out of this coronavirus and return to normal. And I, I'm, you know, that that's exactly wrong. I think this coronavirus can teach us a lot about how we move, need to move into a life economy. And we don't want to go back to, to, to the old normal. We need to create a new normal, which is much better than the old normal. But even now, you know, there's, there's governors, there's, 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 there's presidents all over the world putting the brakes on saying, no, we got to get back out there. We got to build up the economy again. We gotta, and by the economy, they're for the most part looking at the old economy. Um, the death economy. But there's a lot of hope for change. Uh, you know, in, in recent years, even before this happened, we've seen B corporations. My publisher is a B corporation and a benefit corporation. It's one of the reasons I use those, but that publisher. And we've seen the Green New Deal and conscious capitalism. And last August, 192 of the most powerful executives in the world came together and said, hey, it can no longer be about Profits alone, it's got to be about satisfying all of our stakeholders. They, they were actually talking about a global economy, about a life economy. And, but how do each of us move into that? What is your role in that? And as consumers and investors and employees, we play a long, large role in forcing these executives to, to live up to the perception that they've already accepted and created. They've created a perception. Now, how do we get them to make sure they take the actions to move into that? So for me, the, the Jaguar is to, to keep pushing and to keep trying to understand what holds me back from doing something really cool, really important that'll, that'll send the bigger message out. Thanks for asking, Oliver. So John, um, these three questions, I think we can kind of ask them together. Can you describe what a life, or do you have a vision for what a life economy in the US might look like or maybe in the world? And how do we get there from here in 10 words or less? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think how, how we get there is to recognize that for all of us to put pressure on whoever we need to put pressure on to, uh, to move into this system, to move into recognizing that, yeah, we can do a lot more virtually. We don't need to drive our cars so much. We don't need to fly so much. We don't need to do so many materialistic things in our lives. What we do need is, is to pay people to clean up pollution, as I said, to, to regenerate destroyed environments, to come up with new technologies. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's already begun happening uh, in a big way. You know, the whole solar wind industry that's been growing over time. Uh, what, 20 years ago, I think, or 30 years ago, uh, the, the cost of a kilowatt in, in, in solar was $66. Now it's 66 cents. We, we, we made huge progress, but we've still got a long way to go. And so, you know, I think that, that moving into this understanding that, uh, that there is a whole new system for us to, to create, 
each individual has to look at what can I do as an individual. If you take a carpenter, you know, a carpenter can say, what do I, what do I want out of my life? I'd love to work with wood. Uh, how do I make, make a better world using that? Well, I use sustainable wood. What's the Jaguar standing in my way? Well, I'm afraid my clients are gonna say, I can't afford to pay for sustainable materials because they're a little bit more expensive. How do I touch that Jaguar? Ah, the Jaguar tells me to tell my clients, you're, it's not a cost, it's an investment in the future. You may pay a little more, but you're investing for, your, for yourself, your children, your grandchildren. And then the fifth thing, what actions do I take? Well, I go out and I start selling, <laughs> selling my services as a, as, a, as a carpenter who's really specializing in investing in the future. Uh, so whatever we, whoever we are, whatever we do, we can, we can really move into creating this, this life economy. And the other thing is every one of us has access to social media. We're participating in it right now. If you pick one company, if everyone out there picks one company, whatever company you'd like to see change, let's say you guys are from Portland or in that area, let's say you pick Nike, local company, and you write a letter to Nike, an email, a Twitter, a tweet and you get all your social networking circles to, to do the same thing and you say hey nike we i love your products but i'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers in india or indonesia a fair wage or you could do that with any other company you know, until you clean up pollution and and i think many of the executives out there that i've talked to want to get this information they they are afraid they'll lose their jobs if they get too green and they lose market share or the stock, or their stock price goes down. They're they're scared of this, and they know that if that happens to them, then the next guy who gets their job is only going to care about stock price or market share. And so they they want to hear from people like us. They really want to hear from us, and they can take that those emails, those tweets, whatever, to their top um, stockholders and say, "We got to listen to our customers. We can all do that." That's a very very important thing for people to do. It's not just about shopping right. It's about sending the message out. It's about changing the perception through the way you shop on a large scale, as large a scale as you can reach. And with social networking, we can all reach very large scales. <clears throat> well, let's move into the, um, let me see if there's any, okay. Let's move into the uh, shamanic journey then, John. All right. <laughs> Good. I'm glad, I'm glad we got a group here that's receptive to this. Not all groups are, but there are a growing number that are. So I, I'm going to use these, these rattles. They're, they're Mayan. They're Mayan. <laughs> they're Mayan. They're from, they're from the Maya lands of Guatemala. Um, and I do want to suggest, probably most of you already know this. I, I mean, I'm dealing with, I'm, I think I'm, talk, I'm talking to the choir to a certain degree. But I do want to emphasize that I'll be doing this with some rattling as I guide you. It'll be a guided journey. But don't ever become dependent on rattles or drums or chants or anything in particular. Use whatever's around you. The sound of the lawnmower. <laughs> the sound of that awful blowing machine that people use. The barking dogs, the traffic, you know, the airplane motor. Whatever it is, use what's there. You know, that's, that's what life is. And the shamans all are very, very into this. Most of them live in very noisy areas. Roosters are crowing all the time. Some dogs are barking and kids are screaming. And they just go on with, with the whole thing. So but I'm going to use the rattle now because it will help keep us together. So what I'd suggest is everybody get really relaxed as we did earlier. <clears throat> Close your eyes. Take a deep breath and let it out with a good sound. Ah, as we did earlier. Another one. Ah, one more. Just release everything. And now let go of all your thoughts, your concerns, worries, perturbations, anything that perturbs you. Just let go. Let go of everything. Let go of your body completely. You may want to start with your head and just really feel it relaxing. Your face relaxing. Your neck, your throat, your shoulders, your chest, your arms, your hands, all your inner organs, your abdomen, the groin, 
your upper legs, your lower legs, your feet. Just let everything relax completely. <clears throat> and now feel yourself dropping down through the floor, wherever you are, down into the earth. And if you've been trained in some way that you want to go to an upper world, that's fine too. Pachamama, the universe, the earth. But feel yourself being totally loved by the earth. If you're dropping down into her or going up into her, let her massage you, caress you, hold you. Take a moment to just keep going deeper and deeper, feeling the love of the earth, of Pachamama, the universe. Going deeper and deeper, more and more relaxed. Deeper and deeper, feeling more and more loved. Deeper and deeper. And now find yourself entering a sacred place. This is a place where you feel totally safe and secure. It might be a place that you've actually visited, perhaps as a child, or maybe it's a place you've never seen before or some part of the place that you've imagined and gone to many times. Maybe it's right where you are right now. But just take a moment now to explore it with whatever senses you want to bring in. If you're not visual, that's okay. A lot of shamans aren't visual. You might hear it, smell it, taste it, feel it, or just imagine it. I love the word imagine. It means, it comes from I the magus, I the shaman, I the magician. Take a few moments. Now, while you're in the sacred space, ask yourself this question. What is it I most want to do for the rest of my life? What will bring me the greatest joy, the greatest satisfaction, the greatest bliss? And maybe you can visualize yourself already doing it, like you're in a hologram and you're already doing it. And maybe it's something you've already begun, but what do you want to do to even deepen that? As I said before, for me, it would be to keep writing, write more and more. I enjoy, I love doing that. What is it for you? Now the second question, how do I tie this in with the larger world with others? How do I help others through this process? Maybe just one other person, maybe the entire world. For me as a writer, it's writing stories that inspire people to transform a death economy to a life economy. What is it for you? Now take a look at what stands in your way, what has stood in your way, or what might stand in your way of actually doing this. What are the barriers? What are the blockages? What are the voices that might say, oh, you're no good as a writer, 
or voices that say, you don't have enough education, you're too old, you're too young, you're not smart enough, you're not from the right part of society. What are the voices? What, is, or what are the physical aspects of your life or whatever? What's good in your way or might stand in your way of blocking you from realizing your dream, your higher purpose, your bliss? There may be more than one, but start, focus on one right now and you can continue later with others. Now the fourth question, what do you need to do to touch the Jaguar? When you touch the Jaguar, what does it tell you? How do you change your perception? Moving away from that blockage, changing that perception, that voice or whatever it is that's convinced you that you just couldn't quite do that. question, what actions do you need to take beginning tonight, tomorrow? Again, for a writer, it's got to write. What is it for you? And again, there may be more actions that come along, but pick, pick one or two that you can do immediately. It may be as simple as sending a tweet or as complex as running for president or anything in between. Now let your consciousness return to your sacred place. And see yourself sitting with a pad of paper, or maybe it's at your computer keyboard, wherever you'd like to write. And write one sentence that describes what will bring you the most satisfaction, your bliss. One sentence. And now write one sentence as to how this relates to a larger audience than just you. You do to bring this to another person or many other people. One sentence. And now one sentence as to what's blocked you in the past or might block you in the future. And again, pick one thing for all of these questions There may be more to come later, but start right now with just one sentence, one thing. Now one sentence as to how does your perception change when you touch the Jaguar? What's the new perception that will help you move across that perception bridge to the new reality of what you most want in your life? One sentence.
now one set up as to what action do you need to take immediately, tonight, tomorrow, right away. Now make a commitment to actually writing these things down <laughs> on a piece of paper or in your computer later tonight, tomorrow. And every day, reading that list and making a commitment to taking that one action. And that one action may change every day, but each day you'll take another action. And it, you know, don't be harsh on yourself. If you'd rather do it once a week, okay. But make a commitment to really doing it, setting a time, time aside every morning or one day every week to do this. And know that as we do this, not only do we transform our own fears, our own barriers into actions to change ourselves, but we're also going to change the world. Feel that. Feel it in your heart. And now allow your consciousness to return to your sacred space. Give thanks to the sacred space. Know that you can return here anytime you want. You don't need my voice or rattles. Give thanks for going through this process and commit to continuing it. And especially give thanks to yourself for showing up for making this commitment for doing this. I'm gonna be speeding up the rattling and as I do so, allow yourself to leave your sacred space feeling your gratefulness and moving back up through the earth or through the universe, feeling Pachamama's love, being caressed, massaged, held. And it continues speeding up the shaking and feel yourself coming up. And at some point, you arrive back where you began. Start to wiggle your fingers and toes, open your eyes when you're ready. And at the end, I'm going to do four single shakes. If you're not already fully present on the fourth shake, please be so by then. everyone back <laughs> so thank you John that was wonderful yeah. um, so let's see if anyone has, would like to share what their experience was yeah that would be nice to somebody to share what you've just experienced all right raise all right. your hand if you'd like to share uh, Marcy uh, you have to unmute Okay, hi. Didn't think I'd be going first. <laughs> um, let me, uh, well, uh, I don't know how much to share because I know we don't have a lot of time. I want to share, have everybody have time. But um, one of the things I already have been doing for, for many years, 20 something years, is uh, teaching the art of listening. And I have now, it had, had gotten to before the coronavirus, uh, isol you know, I quarantines and everything. I had been teaching to full classes in libraries and around the community and everything. And now I have to go do something different. I have to, 
I, I resist doing videos. I resist doing this, you know, and all that kind of thing. And I love being in a room where I feel each other and I can see what's going on. And, um, so I've allowed that to be a block, you know, the techno technology, the legalities of going online, the being making videos that everybody can spread around and all the intricacies of that just scares me. I like being in a room, it begins beginning, middle and end and it's done, you know, and so uh, that scares me. So I basically just realized that I just, I made some, a I figured the actions to figure out the the logistics. I've had people hand me cameras. I mean, I have them sitting here. Everything's right here to do it. Everybody says the invitation has been there. So I realized that I have been seeing these big boulders, these big blocks. And now I decided, so the last thing that you said was, or, you know, was that I, I'm going to make these boulders into stepping stones. I'm just going to take them and lie them down and step on them and move forward. So, and just make it happen. So. <laughs> That's so beautiful, Marcy. Thank you so much. That was really yeah. beautiful. Really appreciate it. I'm glad you went first. <laughs> Thank you. Pardon? I'm glad you went first. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Who's next? Anyone else? Rosie? I um, didn't think I had anything really big to share, but all of a sudden I realized at the very beginning of that presentation, when you had us go down into Mother Earth and be held by her, Mother Earth told me something that I kind of knew, and but I've, I've also had doubts, but she just held me and she said, we want you to survive because we have work for you to do. Could you get up out of this journey and go take some medicine because you have a major blood clot forming in your leg. Could you do it now? And I did, and I was in an altered state and I never lost any of the journey. Like I just stayed in it all the time. I, took, I went and took my, you know, omega-3s and uh, the blood clot is dissolving and I had a powerful experience anyway. I went into an altered state and then I heard you say, you must come out by the count of four. And I went, where was I? And you went, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Rosie. That's, That's great. Mark, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, for me, I was appreciating the use of the trance state and the hypnotic sense of it. And what's the irony of that is the thing that came to me was right. I'm currently using hypnosis with people, but what's my passion is what I calling de hypnosis and the ability to like you were addressing that, how we hold the thoughts that hold our reality together can shift and change. And as individuals, I'm always trying to work on how to change everybody out there first, right? Like if all those people got that we're all one, then we'd all be one, right? <laughs> and what has come to me is um, to really sink into my own truth and find the center that stills place into the center and then come from a place of uh, the dehypnosis, but I have to do the work to make it um, tangible. I have it on the inside in that void, in that space, but to, to actually sit down and do the work. So uh, the ideas of how to organize the space and, and uh, tangible things are coming to me now. Wow, thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, hypnosis is really a form of shamanic journeying, you know? Yeah. It's interesting, shamans around the world, as I said, it's all based on perception changing reality, but the language and the rituals are different. So in the Amazon, they use a lot of sacred plants. In the Andes, they use, sto they use stones and metals and eggs and things from there. Uh, in our culture, the, the, our shamans are the psychotherapists, really, and they use language for the most part. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, I think, uh, more and more sort of shamanic journeys, hypnosis. Thanks for sharing that, Mark. Really, really appreciate it, all of you. Anybody else? 
Dottie. Dottie, 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 Dottie. Oh, Janine? Yes. <laughs> You're really oh, echoing. I had, I had to turn my phone off. Okay. Are you still there? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Whoa, I was really getting, okay. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much, John. This, this has been, you have answered many questions for me because you are a writer and I am writing and I actually have published two books and I, I have a third one that is just, well, I have many more, but one in particular right now that I would like to do that is dear to my heart. Um, but I need a publisher and I haven't figured out how to find a, a good publisher, one that I can actually work with. Um, the self-publishing companies are the pits basically. So anyway, that's my block. Um, my biggest block and I have others that I can deal with but thank you so much for for giving these questions mm, um, let me uh, comment on that for just a moment confessions of an economic hitman was rejected by 39 publishers <laughs> before one accepted it and then within a couple of weeks it went on the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for a year and a half and it sold now more than two million copies in 30 some odd languages so don't ever get discouraged. <laughs> About the time I get the sixth or seventh rejection slip, they're like, oh, I ought to just give up. Nobody wants my writing. And then I remember that English professor, and I said, wait a minute, the, 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 the editor that just reset, just, just, just I, I did a visualization. The editor that just sent this back, ah, he had a fight with his wife before he came into the office that morning. He just put everything in the rejection file. Ah, this editor, she, she had a headache when she came in and she just threw everything out. Oh, this person doesn't like my politics. Or this person, I, you know. So, so you know, I, I, it's really important to touch that Jaguar of, of you know, whatever it is holding you back from finding that publisher. You, you will find the publisher, but it may take a lot of patience and perseverance. <laughs> And and a, a a really strong perception about it. So yeah, I and I've been there. And and when I published Confessions, I'd already published five books on shamanism. I knew that publisher wasn't the right one for for Confessions, and he knew it. We both knew it. We agreed on that. And I couldn't find anybody else. It took a long time. Well, I've been messing around with these indie publishers, and I think I need to stop doing that and go to a real publisher, yeah. a traditional publisher, perhaps. Is it nonfiction or fiction? No, always it's nonfiction. All my writing is nonfiction. Uh -huh. But I, but I guess I just have to bite the bullet and and start actually going through the process to try and find a traditional publisher. Hmm. Maybe I can help you. Uh, so, so I guess a daughter, you could probably. I, I see the name J Z O. What what is your name? Joni. 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 Mm -hmm. So maybe. Dottie, you can help her get in touch with me later. Maybe my publisher would be interested. I don't know. We, we, can, we can have a further communication about this. And I'd, I'd offer that to any, anybody in this group, too, if, you know, within reason. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank That's you. Right. To start. John, did you have a question? Did, did you raise your hand? Yeah, John. You have to unmute. Since you ask. Um, so I'm also a writer. I'm actually working on a book right now and and I've got a publisher and it's due June 1st and all that. And <laughs> well, I was kind of, you know, I've gone through the journey that uh, you're, you're, you're describing there. Um, 106 queries, no, 176 queries to get to an agent and the agent took 52 uh, rejections, or no, 51 rejections to get to the publisher. So oh. it was a journey, about a year-long journey. Mm. Um, that, But that really was kind of confusing me because, okay, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And all, you know, this is, this is like my thing I'm dealing with in the next two weeks. It's due right now. Um, but as I went through your process, thinking I wasn't getting anywhere, <laughs> I realized that poetry is really my love. You know, I love writing, but poetry is, and I have, if I think of it in terms of a jaguar, I've always dismissed poetry as being sort of, um, not valuable in reaching a large audience. 
uh, not not having a lot of impact. And uh, so there's that sort of, so there's this sort of the dismissing of my truest love, if you will, in favor of the one that actually seems to be working finally after, you know, decades of, of writing to myself, so to say. Um, and then, I, well, what could I do? Well, one thing is, you know, there's, first of all, there's a next book. And then the second thing is, I'm going to give myself a simple challenge of writing a poem a week and just, you know, treat that as important. Yeah, great. Go for it. And you really follow your bliss, you know. Yeah. I was asked on a, on a show yesterday, what, of all books that I've ever read, what would I most recommend? And, and I said, Macbeth, or any Shakespeare, actually. And it was all poetry. You know, the, probably the greatest writer in the English language still is and probably the most read. I don't know the statistics, but Shakespeare, and he wrote in poetry. So don't dismiss it. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it, John. Thank it's you. A great name. I don't know why you left the, the, the H out, though. Um, well, <laughs> my mother didn't want such a common name as J-O-H-N. Ah, OK. And, and my great grandfather is J O H N. So uh, there you go. see the the um, uh, mediated challenge my parents had. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. I, I, I really appreciate it. I, what you've been through as a writer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we don't actually have time to unstring the beads tonight. We have, um, we only have about five minutes left. So, is there anybody else that would like to say one last thing or? Briefly, before we thank John for the last time and close off, anybody? I will if nobody else wants to. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I'd like to um, reiterate for everybody that I, I think we, we are all living in the most blessed of times. Um, we are really able to listen to Pachamama, the earth, and it is a time when we didn't get into the crops of the eagle and the condor, but that's basically mind and heart coming together, the indigenous cultures of the world based in the heart, coming together with the scientific ones, the industrial ones, and it's happening, and that leads to higher consciousness, that's the prophecy, and you're in it, I mean, we're all, we're, we're alive mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. part of this, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to be part of, so. mm -hmm. I just invite you all to feel the ecstasy of, of where we are right now. And I hope we can continue, you know, please, please do, you know, if you go to my website, johnperkins.org and, and, and uh, you can join this, uh, this Facebook group that we're gonna be deep with a Mayan Shaman next Thursday. I would love to continue this process with all of you. A great group and I just, I so appreciate all of us coming together here tonight. It's been really, really fun. 